think people are really surprised to see the link between the juvenile tarpon, nice. which are not easily accessible, so they're kind of out of sight, out of mind for most anglers. You know, a lot of times they're coming in to focus on the big fish and, and the biggest tarpon that they can catch, that they don't really see the tie-in to the juveniles and don't really understand the habitat and the imminent danger that it's in. And you have a fish that can live to 80 years old and, you know, you're fishing for the 20, 30, 50 year old fish, you don't think of them as babies. But when you start to think about what happened in Florida and specifically the Keys as far as development, but it's stuff that we did decades ago. We've got to be able to restore the potential habitats that we have left in order to keep conserving the fishery. Keep going slow. Here he comes. Keep going, keep going slow. Keep going. Got him. Pull. Let him go. Nasty. Nasty, buddy. Good job. Oh. Oh. Good job, baby. Woo, what a shot that was. Got him, baby. Got him, baby. Whoa, Mitchell. Oh, look at that. Look at the shoes on that thing, huh? Beautiful. Hell yeah. I got him, man. I got him, baby. You got him? I got him. That's a big fish. Look at the size of that fish. Dude, that's a giant fish. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, oh, oh. Shaw, Shaw. Shaw, Well, thank you for making this trek down here to be with us. Yeah, it's gonna be a fun time. And educate us on everything that you got, your part is with BTT and your role with a juvenile tarpon. Yep. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so typically the tarpon that I'm looking at are 12 inches and under. And that's really so we can kind of hone in on the one and two year old fish. However, what you're also touching on is the size when it comes to habitat, right? So what we're able to find in these nursery habitats is just because that there are tarpon in a nursery habitat, it doesn't mean it's a good habitat. Actually, I would love for you to show me um, with the chart here, you know, that's the best thing with this Florida Marine Tracks. But what's really special about the Simrad is that it allows this chip, which is a Florida Marine Tracks chip, to show all of its software. And what this software is, it's a Google Earth layover of the whole state of Florida. And it shows everything from channel markers to every, every path that you can navigate to the outlines of all the flats to the dangerous zones. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, like no, you said, the detail's amazing. It's amazing, right? And, and it shows, and this is just this bay that we're in here right now. You know, when you zoom out, it's the whole state of Florida. I would love for you to show us, you know, some of the stuff that you've been working on um, with these little back, you know, uh, tarpon estuaries and everything. And I think you said you're up here towards Charlotte Harbor a little bit. Understanding where these habitats are and how they function is so important. So in Charlotte Harbor, we started a mapping project. So what we're doing is looking in, within the Charlotte Harbor watershed, um, where are there places where there currently are juvenile tarpon? So that way we can protect them or either restore them. And then eventually what we'll do is look at places where tarpon should be that maybe haven't been reported to us yet. So where are their potential nursery habitats for either for protection or habitat restoration? Well, let's go out and let's go see if we can't get a couple and learn some more about what we need to do with this. As a guide fishing for tarpon, I feel like I know tarpon, right? I feel like I know it. I mean, but I don't know nothing. I know how to feed them, how to find them, how to catch them, but I don't know anything about how that tarpon, where it started, where, where it came from, where they live, where they hatch, how they spawn, all this. And working with BTT has is, is, is taught me this, but I got to spend this day with Joe Ellen. And you talk about somebody that knows tarpon. It, she knows tarpon. A big misconception about conservation organizations is that we want to prevent people from fishing. And that's not the case at all. At BTT, we're all anglers. We want to be able to keep fishing. We want our kids to be able to keep fishing. For generations, we want to be able to keep fishing. In order to do that, we have to protect the fisheries now. BTT is a conservation organization, but where we differ is that all of our initiatives are science and research based. Although we have scientists on staff with BTT, we rely heavily on collaborations with universities, other organizations like us, our state management agencies, and also the guides and anglers that are on the waters every day. Our sole mission is to conserve and also to enhance our bonefish, tarpon, and permit populations and their habitats.
Look at the size of that fish. This is a beast, dude. Beast mode. Fish the legend. At Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, we're working to make sure that you'll find healthy populations of bonefish, tarpon, and permit at your favorite destinations. From the Florida Keys to Belize, from the Bahamas to Mexico. But we need your help to fight for clean water and healthy habitats. After all, if we don't conserve our flats fisheries, who will? Please support us today at btt.org and help us bring science to the fight. Silver Kings is brought to you in part by Maverick Boats, Fish the Legend. Yamaha, reliability starts here. Florida Marine Tracks, clarity in navigation. And by Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, bringing science to the fight. And now, 60 seconds in the millhouse. I think I can speak on everybody that knows you, that you, we all hold you in such high regard in so many ways. Not only wow. as a great friend, a great fishing guide, possibly the mayor of what we stand for as far as the fishing capital of the world, especially the flats fishing world. Um, you know, you're 80 years old. You've you're been, right. You've been around. <laughs> I have. Looking back at your life, what are you most proud of? Surviving. <laughs> Enduring. <laughs> Enduring. <laughs> oh. I mean, you've met so much to so many people, and I think Randy Tao, you know, he's been like a, a, a son for you, yeah. and he's been like a, a father figure to him. Maybe Crager a little bit. Crager. Maybe... Um, Robert Klein, you know, you got so many good friends, you yeah. know, a, a younger generation that looked up to you. So they're all great boys. They're, you know, they're all great fishermen. But, uh, yeah, we all love you. Well, I love all these guys and, and all the anglers, you know. Ted Williams, obviously the, the great ball player that he was, you know, such a big figure in baseball and, and in fishing too, he won the gold cup twice. Have you, did you ever fish with Ted Williams? Yeah, I fished him a couple of times. What that was, was, that was enough. What was that like? Oh, it was awesome. It, it was the main thing that we did with Ted Williams when Sears would put on a, a movie, you know, do a, a shoot. There were like 10 or 12 guides in that thing uh, with all of these different people. The people that were writing his part because he couldn't make a talking movie because of his language, you know, and uh, the profanity. Oh yeah. And so I heard he 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 uh, he cursed so well it was almost poetic. It, <laughs> he come walking out of the hardware store one day, and I was walking out of the lumber yard, and uh, he seen me across the street. And he yelled out, hey, Porky, big deal. And I said, hey, Bush, there's two ladies standing right behind you. And he turned, he turned around and he looked up and said, the lady says, I've never heard such language. He says, don't you know who I am? I'm Ted Williams. I'm the worst cusser in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Your history is just so legendary that we're honored and privileged to have you here. Well, it's been my privilege to be here. To watch this and other full-length episodes of the Millhouse podcast, go to YouTube or wherever you find your podcasts. I just, I think you guys are doing a great thing. Well, thank you. It's neat being in all these areas like this. It's just, you know, there's just so much life. So a lot of times, this watches some. You can, it's always good. It's a spider web coming up here. Yeah. What do you want me to do? You can duck it. You want to hold it or keep going? No, no, I'm going to keep going. There's okay. an opening. So how many years have you been studying tarpon? 
So I started with BTT in 2009, um, but I didn't really start honing in on tarpon until about 2012. That's when I started my master's at University of Florida, and my main focus was on juvenile tarpon habitat. There really wasn't a lot of data, a lot of information in the scientific literature about juvenile tarpon in general. Um, so I was able to get some of the first life history estimates. And that's kind of where we realized that, uh, you know, the fish in, in this particular habitat, which was an old golf course pond that was left abandoned, they just weren't growing. You, you really realize how big of an impact an environment makes, you know, on the juvenile fish. Joe, try to get me one up in that cove there, as far as you can. Okay. Nice little twitch. A little tap. He's on it. Real. Oh, wait. Got him. Hard. Nice. Real, real, real. Keep it low. There he goes. A perfect little guy. Nice. Remember the bow to him there. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. Cool. Very cool. I hope he's going to do some more. Now, how old would that fish usually roughly be? That's a really good question. So, in a natural habitat, I would say that this guy might be a two-year-old. Okay. Um, if we're looking at those those uh, kind of restored habitat, not restored yet, but in need of restoration, I mean, this guy could be four or five years old. Oh, he's coming back around. So, I mean, obviously this is a natural habitat. So yeah. this this fish, what you were saying, it could be in the the two two-year-old Yeah, so this guy could have been spawned a couple years ago. They're, they spawn in the summers, or I guess maybe down here in your area, maybe in the late spring. Okay. Perfect, so. Nice. This guy's a little bit big for the nursery habitat, so he's probably come out into the estuary, and he'll hang out here for, you know, about five or six years before he's able to start spawning. Okay. Well, you know, he's been very great to us. Get a little to learn about him. I'm thinking it's time for him to go. Yeah, get big. See you, buddy. Very nice. Your time on the water is precious. You return season after season to make unforgettable memories, fight a few fish, reconnect with friends, and recenter yourself. If you count on having this time, you need an outboard you can count on to power it. That's why boaters stay with Yamaha for the long run, for life. They know reliability starts here. Silver Kings is brought to you in part by Pathfinder Boats, Angler Driven. Free Fly Apparel, Comfort On, Adventure Out. Yeti Coolers, Built for the Wild. And by Smith, the experience is everything. So it gets like shallow here and then there's another little rock quarry. There you go. Kind of hole up in front of us. Real? Fast? Real hard? <laughs> you still got him? Yeah. Real, real, real. It's on. Is that yeah. Cuda? No. Tarpon. Is it tarpon? Hey, it no, is no. a tarpon. <laughs> that didn't that didn't take long there. Did I foul hooker? <laughs> Tiny but mighty. And so this one might even just be a year old. Yeah, this guy's, um, he could have been spawned this spring, but most likely I'd say probably the last spring. Look at that fish, you know? It's just, it's just beautiful to see one that small. Right? You, know, you don't ever really catch them this small. 
You know, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Let's let that one go. Come on, baby girl. See ya. Look at you on a roll. Put you another one in there. Maybe, maybe we'll go down to even a smaller size in there. They're in there. Nice, that's gonna work. Shouldn't take long. Got him. Got him. Another fish that we would say that's maybe a year or under. Yep, right? say, or a year and a half maybe. Year and a half. Year and a half in a natural habitat. All right, buddy. Now, even on a fish this size, yep. in these areas you're working, you would you would still put a tag in a fish this? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and you, is there a tag you could show me that yeah. and, and how this would go down? Yeah, I brought a couple with me. Oh, okay. If a fish is under eight inches, we can put that small tag in, okay. 13 millimeter. This guy's big enough that he can take the 23 millimeter tag. That really just helps with reed range. You want to be able to put the bigger tag, but without being too cumbersome for the now, fish. Now, where would you put that tag? Yeah, so what do I do is pull a couple scales out with a scalpel, just like in Grey's Anatomy, you know, okay. 15 blade, <laughs> and then um, make a little incision right here, just big enough, pop okay. the tag inside. There's a muscle cavity. It really only takes less than a week, only a couple days and to then heal it... over. Uh, doesn't need, after we do the incision, doesn't need any stitches, and like, like that. that. Yep. And and just, it just naturally it holds itself in there. Naturally holds itself in. The tag is oriented along the fish, so it's not gonna pop out of the incision. One of the reasons that we're not tagging today is that we really only tag in places where we have studies going on, like the restoration site. So we've gotta be able to see where they're moving. And these are, you know, small scale tags. Um, not everybody would be able to fish for for fish like this, so we don't tag just for fun. I gotcha. Um, but using those antenna rays, or if we're netting, or fishing in certain areas where we're consistently going back um, to check either the growth, or survival, or abundance, those are things that we can tell with the tag, and obviously, especially movement. The adult population strictly relies on these nursery habitats and how productive they are. And by productive, I mean how fast can these juveniles grow? How many are there, the abundance? survival, can they live to be a certain size or a certain age to leave the nursery habitat? And then also immigration or actually leaving the system. Sometimes the larvae come in on high water events and they get trapped in these coastal ponds or other marshy areas that aren't always connected and don't always reconnect to the estuary and out into our waterways. Growth is directly impacted by how healthy these habitats are. So a fish in a natural habitat can grow 10, maybe even 12 inches a year versus fish in these degraded habitats like the canal systems or in these disconnected ponds and marshes. They're not growing as fast, which really puts them at a disadvantage. Now, once these waterways are connected again, let's say we have another storm event, then they'll be able to move out into the estuary, which means that if these little guys are reconnected or we're able to restore these habitats, then they can grow up to 250 pounds or 80 years old, which we know tarpon are capable of. Should have taken my socks off, huh? No. Oh, sorry I didn't have boots. Not you. A loser. No. <laughs> One pathetic loser. That's it. I would have been good. <laughs> Silver Kings is brought to you in part by Traeger Grills. Experience the evolution of fire. Mako Reels, built to last, built to stop. Simred Chart Plotters, go with confidence. And by Shimano Fishing Products and G Loomis Rods, feel connected. And now, a minute from our conservation partner, Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Florida is the tarpon fishing capital of the world. Anglers here get shots at tarpon from the northern Gulf of Mexico to the southernmost tip of the Florida Keys and all the way up the Atlantic coast. 
Although most of us are focused on the adults, it's really the juvenile tarpon that drive the fishery. Juvenile tarpon depend on mangrove and marsh wetland habitats. These habitats are typically close to human activities like development. This results in habitat loss and degradation from nutrient runoff and altered freshwater flows. Without thriving juvenile populations, there would be no adults to support the fishery. Sadly, there's already been too much habitat loss and more is lost every single year. Even if management agencies protect the natural nursery habitat that remains, it won't be enough. Habitat restoration is the way forward. Bonefish and Tarpon Trust is now studying the best methods for habitat restoration to protect the tarpon fishery. To date, we have funded, monitored, or consulted on seven restoration projects in the southeastern United States. By testing different habitat restoration designs, we'll be able to guide future habitat restoration to maximize the benefits and productivity to the tarpon fishery. Habitat restoration is the future of our fisheries, and BTT is leading the way. To learn more, visit btt.org slash tarpon. People don't realize that when they're fishing for the big fish, this is really what's driving the fishery, right? If we don't have these guys surviving and thriving, then we don't have those bigger fish. Tarpon live about 60 to 80 years old. So, so a big, you know, mature 120, 130 pound female, that's 60. Well, at some point they, they kind of stop growing, right? Okay. They don't need to get any bigger. So think about once they get to about 12 years old, um, oh. they're not gonna grow as fast past that. So a 130 pound fish, female, could be anywhere from let's say, you know, 15 to 60 years old. Oh, wow. So think about the things that we were doing in Isla Mirada as far as building and, and runoff, you know, 50 years ago, even yeah. 30 years ago. I mean, it's just cool to come back here to just see them. Yeah, so these fish certainly won't have the same kind of growth rates that we were looking at the ones in those, those happy natural habitats. We might have to throw a couple shrimpies in there. Oh. Drop it right in on them. Oh, all right. There you go. It such... <laughs> I don't know what to do with my hands. I just don't know what to do with my hands. Like point you know? You got one? I don't know. Real. Real. Oh. What do we got in there? Snapper? No, it's got to be one. Oh, right. Look at that thing. I don't want you to get hurt, buddy. Come here. Wow. Now, look at that little guy. I mean, like you said, because he sends it stuck in this little pond here, this could be a six, seven year old fish. Yeah, there's really no way that we know. But I mean, that's that's the smallest one so far. Cute little guy. Look at that. Man, it's awesome. It's funny. All right, let's let him get back into his. Shrimp was the way to go. Awesome. Oh, oh man. Oh my god. Look at this micro guy. Look at this micro guy. I'm gonna get this out, I promise you. I promise you. Beautiful. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. That was awesome. That was good. It's hard to hook those things. Yeah. It really is. I learned so much. I mean, I was so fascinated on everything that she had, and I was actually blown away with so much knowledge. Look who hasn't been here all week, huh? <laughs> now, yeah. Is that a rental? Yeah. You got them welding goggles? Yeah. OK. Hey, you tell Lewis, too, when you see him, I'm going to put him in a headlock. Won't be all right in the breaking time. Won't be all right, clouds or sun. Won't be all right, whatever comes. Who is your favorite instructor? Yeah. <laughs>